Like many of you, I spent a significant amount of time immersed in stories. And as much as I've enjoyed and let myself be inspired by the countless stories I've experienced through a variety of mediums, there's one thing I've always wondered about. If stories, like all forms of art, are supposed to reflect life, either by directly representing it, or by forming a more symbolical mirror, then why are they so different from reality? And by different, I don't mean that they take place in imaginary worlds or are filled with fantastical elements. I mean that at their most fundamental level, there exists a dissonance between the way stories are structured and the way we experience our own lives. Perhaps the most famous conceptualization of storytelling is Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces, in which he uncovers the archetypal structure, the so-called monomyth, although more commonly referred to as the hero's journey, that is fundamental to countless stories across different ages and different cultures. The hero's journey articulates the transformative process, or simply the adventure, that a hero embarks upon, which leads them outside of their own ordinary world into a new unknown one where they encounter specific characters, face a crisis, and eventually return as a changed person. Even in this brief summary, we can immediately see the dissonance with our own lives. Whereas the hero's journey is clearly structured, our own often feels messy and chaotic. Whereas the hero encounters events and characters that are purposeful to the larger adventure, our own experiences often feel incidental and lacking in tangible meaning. And whereas the hero almost always has a transformative arc, we ourselves do not walk such defined paths. Where do these differences come from? Why do we tell stories so differently from the way we live them? And, somewhat inversely, what happens when we do approach our own experiences as stories? What are the implications of viewing our lives as heroes' journeys? I've graced the surface of these questions in other videos, like the fantasy of ultimate purpose, and my video on It's a Wonderful Life, which, among other things, explores the relation between the hero's journey and modern individualism. But a while back I came across a book called Adventures Don't Exist, written by two Dutch philosophers who perfectly articulate and expand on everything I wanted to say about it. Unfortunately, as of yet, the book has not been translated into other languages, but seeing as their main thesis is built on the work of other, more widely available philosophers, I'll make sure to refer to their references as well. So, over the course of the next few videos, let's begin a new journey. Let's really dive into the principles of storytelling and their relation to our own identities. Starting today with the fundamental difference between stories and reality. Up! Get up! Once there was an ordinary world. Now! in which a hero lived an ordinary life. Whether this world resembles our own, either past or present, hey, 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 come on. or if it's a more imaginative place, like a distant planet or a fantastical realm, doesn't really matter. What matters is that to the hero, this is ordinary existence. After all, where else does the extraordinary emerge, if not out of the ordinary? It is from this place that the hero is called to adventure, to a journey into a new world. They encounter someone or something that disrupts the course of their ordinary life. A mysterious stranger, a message, a peculiar object, a promise. Hey, we were saving that! But today, I guarantee it. For the call to adventure, in whatever form it comes, implies that our hero is no longer ordinary, but special. You're a wizard, Harry. I'm a what? There's another world waiting for them. An evil force to defeat, a universe to save. 
It's a goal that seems frightening at first and is often downright refused. You've got the wrong hobbit. Perhaps the hero feels they cannot leave their ordinary world because of various obligations within it. I can't get involved. I've got work to do. Perhaps it is because they feel they are not brave or capable enough to live up to the task. Luckily, a mentor already familiar with the world beyond is ready to help. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. And our hero is guided over the threshold into the unknown. I'm going on an adventure! As you can see, these simple narrative elements can be found in most popular stories. The beginning in the ordinary world, the call to adventure, and the supernatural aid guiding the would-be hero. They are the first steps in Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. If we briefly review the rest of the circle, we find that the same goes for the other steps. The adaptation to the unfamiliar, often marked by a period of training or investigation, the first victory and transformation, the atonement for the hero's venturing through the world of chaos, followed by the moment of ultimate darkness, the moment where all hope for a safe return and happy ending seemed to be lost. The realization that changes the initial goal of the hero and marks the moment of growth and maturation, which eventually rescues them from disaster. Finally, there is the moment of return, now a master of two worlds. Our hero is back in their ordinary world, but has found a renewed balance and peace. While it is easy to recognize this archetypal structure in grand adventures like Star Wars, The Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter, where the stakes are high and the heroic victories are triumphantly celebrated, it is also present in stories that seem less grand and less adventurous. Can I buy you a drink? No. You say no a lot, don't you? No. Oh boy. Take any romantic comedy for example and there's a good chance you'll find the same foundations of the hero's journey. In these stories, the call to adventure often comes in the form of a mysterious stranger that propels the hero on a romantic journey. Here too, we see the monomythical circle being played out as the new couple falls in love, faces some kind of conflict that breaks them apart for a little bit, which will soon be followed by our hero realizing something they should have known all along, and making one final effort in the name of love. A dash to the airport, a grand romantic gesture. You know how it goes. The lovers are reunited once again and live happily ever after. Before we get into the analysis of the hero's journey and how it relates to real life, I briefly want to address one more type of story that does seem to break from this traditional structure, and that is the tragedy. The first season of Game of Thrones starts out pretty conventionally. There's a heroic character by the name of Ned Stark who is presented as a man of honor and principles in an otherwise ruthless and chaotic world. The man who passes the sentence should swing the sword. Like any other hero, he too goes on a journey beyond the world he knows. But whereas the hero's journey ends in a victorious return, Ned's journey ends in an unexpected tragedy. It is this apparent break from traditional storytelling that made the first few seasons of Game of Thrones so popular. Whereas in other stories you could be fairly certain that the main hero, despite facing a significant conflict, wouldn't unceremoniously die halfway along the journey. In Game of Thrones, you were never quite sure about the fate that would befall the characters. But even here there's a structure at the foundation, a sort of inversion of the hero's journey, one that goes all the way back to the ancient tragedies in which, as conceptualized by Aristotle in his Poetics, we are presented with a heroic character who goes on an adventurous journey. But instead of them claiming a victory through transformation, they instead find their downfall through a fundamental flaw in their character. What makes a tragic hero tragic is that they meet their fate because they are acting with good intentions. 
Ned Stark's demise was set in motion because he discovered the secret that put the honorable, yet also stubborn principles of his character at odds with his loyalty to the king, and more generally, with the rules of the Game of Thrones. When you play the Game of Thrones you win, or you die. There is no middle ground. In another example, in Breaking Bad, Walter White initially starts cooking meth to pay for his cancer treatments, but his fundamental flaw of grandiosity ultimately corrupts his journey, and he too meets his tragic fate. So while the specific journey of the tragic hero is different from that of the triumphant one, there is still a similar structure at the core, except instead of the steps of the hero's journey leading to a victorious return, they lead to a tragic downfall. What they have in common, however, is that all these steps in the hero's journey, regardless if they lead to a victorious or tragic outcome, all serve a singular purpose. And this, at last, brings us to the fundamental difference between stories and reality. Knowing how most popular stories play out according to similar structural foundations, we can begin to understand why they are so fundamentally different from reality. For there's one simple yet important element that separates the heroic journeys of, let's say, Luke Skywalker, Harry Potter, and Neo from those of our own. And that is that they didn't just happen to go on heroic journeys. They were destined to. You are the one, Neo. I've spent my entire life looking for you. They were never truly ordinary, but were already fated to become extraordinary heroes long before that first call to adventure. Luke Skywalker is the son of Darth Vader, and it is this lineage and his subsequent special connection to the Force that made his heroic journey inevitable. The same goes for Harry Potter, whose tragic past connected him to the main villain and granted him extraordinary magical potential. In the case of Neo, this heroic destiny is even clearer through a prophecy that explicitly states that he, and no one else, is the one. The Oracle prophesized his return, and that his coming would hail the destruction of the Matrix. Looking at some other popular stories, we see the same recurring trend. As a descendant of royal blood, Simba is born to become king, as is Aragorn, as is T'Challa. It is your time to be king. Clark Kent's innate powers destined him to become Superman. You will give the people of Earth an ideal to strive towards. Just as Diana's origins led to her becoming Wonder Woman. It is a form of determinism that is present in most stories. It is there in a slightly more complicated version in Interstellar, in which Cooper and his daughter were specifically chosen by greater forces for their parts in the adventure. Why me? And it is present in the Terminator films where the main heroes are not drawn into the adventure through random selection, but because of a pre-existing destiny that made them unique compared to anyone else. There was one man who taught us to fight. Your son, Sarah. Your unborn son. Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines also shows the tragic inversion of this heroic destiny, as here the story is driven by a prophecy that promises not a hero, but a tragedy. One that, despite the hero's best efforts, is fulfilled at the end. Our destiny was never to stop Judgment Day. It was merely to survive it. Another example of this is Anakin's transformation into the villain Darth Vader in the Star Wars prequels. Here we have two different prophecies guiding the course of the story. The first being that Anakin will bring balance to the Force, which initially promises a more traditional heroic journey. But then we learn of a second, darker prophecy as Anakin becomes plagued by visions of his wife dying. And it is because of these visions that he grows fearful and angry and eventually turns to the dark side. In doing so, he too ultimately fulfills his tragic prophecy. In your anger, you 
killed her. But what about all the ordinary heroes? The ones who weren't born to kings and queens, who don't have innate special powers, or a prophecy connected to their existence? What about the underdogs who came from nothing and either ascended to heroism or fell into tragedy by virtue of their own character? Three, two, one. Think about the citizens who built themselves into superheroes or the gangsters who rose up the ranks of a criminal organization only to bring about their own downfall. Or the ordinary individuals who just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Come out to the coast, we'll get together, have a few laughs. <laughs> or let's look a little closer to real life and all the biographies of historic people. All the musicians who after a long struggle became world famous. All the billionaire mavericks who started out in their garages or dorm rooms. Everyone who achieved or experienced something extraordinary enough that we are now retelling their tales. Can it be said of all these characters that they were destined to go on heroes' journeys? That they were never as ordinary as they appeared? In a way, yes. While none of these characters were explicitly destined for a greater purpose, it is the very structure of the hero's journey, and by extension, the act of retelling it, that grants them this purpose anyways. All stories are essentially told backwards by their very nature. They are told already knowing where it's going to go. As such, the end is always built into the beginning. And as a consequence, the beginning and the journey that follows is always made up of selected parts that are directly meaningful to the end. It is why everything we see the hero do is filled with promise and purpose, and why we rarely see them spend a lot of time doing uninteresting, ordinary, everyday things like eating, folding laundry, or filling out tax forms. It is also why the hero never does something awkward that significantly stumbles the journey. The soldier never sprains his ankle and has to sit out the big battle. Nor does the boxer get onset diarrhea just before the climactic fight. Or do they? Oh, cut my gloves off. What's wrong? I'm freaking out, okay? I'm freaking out right now. I gotta take a shit. A little nervous? <laughs> nervous. Hurry up. There are plenty of popular films that deliberately subvert some aspects of the hero's journey. Although, these are mostly smaller moments that serve as unexpected twists. Or as comic relief. Superhero landing. She gonna do a superhero landing. Wait for it! There are, however, some popular films that follow the hero's journey while still providing a more meaningful commentary on it. The ending of The Lord of the Rings, for example, shows that the hero's return isn't always as easy and triumphant as we might imagine it to be. Frodo finds his way back to the Shire, but truly return, he does not. It's an ending that shows how the trauma experienced along the way isn't always in service of some greater end. Sometimes pain is just that. Another interesting example is Blade Runner 2049, in which the main character, a replicant, comes to believe he is special, that he is born with a unique destiny. A promise of cosmic purpose that is eventually pulled out from under him as it turns out he wasn't special at all. You imagined it was you. And that he wasn't going on a hero's journey in the way he thought he did. Star Wars The Last Jedi tried to do a similar thing as the series' new hero, Rey, was foreshadowed to be of important ancestry, but was later revealed to be simply an ordinary individual like everyone else. You have no place in this story. You come from nothing. You're nothing. The twist, however, was undone in The Rise of Skywalker, in which it was revealed that Rey was of special heritage after all, and therefore that there was some innate destiny within her being that once again made her a classical hero. 
There are of course more examples of mainstream films that play around with the individual elements of the hero's journey, or use them for the purpose of commentary, but still it is extremely rare for them to significantly break from the concept as a whole. For that you really have to turn to arthouse films which are generally more likely to interrogate and challenge the structures of traditional storytelling. But even here we find the same rules that make these stories distinct from reality. The famous literary principle of Chekhov's gun for example states that every element in a story must be significant. That if you present a rifle hanging on the wall it has to go off at some point. Again, the end is built into the beginning, for unlike an actual gun, Chekhov's gun exists with an innate destiny. And furthermore, even the most unconventional films cannot escape having some sort of ordering principle, as after all they are still products that have defined boundaries. They exist within their own little universe that begins with an opening shot and ends with the credits. And it is within these confines that the story, however incomprehensible it may be, is still organized with some measure of intent and outside overview. However, if you dig far enough, you will certainly find experimental films that dismiss the idea of purposeful storytelling altogether. And although these films can be really interesting and meaningful for a lot of people, it is telling that these structurally chaotic and unheroic films never really break into the mainstream, nor do they truly become part of our collective subconscious. And besides, as Ernest Hemingway once pointed out, even in stories that seem to be made up of insignificant, incoherent elements, people will still project meaningful patterns on them anyways. It seems as if there is a part of us that desires the purposeful structure of adventures that wants stories to be meaningful, heroic journeys, that longs for that innate destiny. But why? Now that we've discussed how most popular stories, unlike our own lives, unfold according to an archetypal structure in which every character trait that was shown, every effort that is made, every event that is experienced, every victory, every defeat, every step along the way, tends to be imbued with an inherent sense of purpose, we can also see what makes them so appealing. It's obviously comforting to believe that our lives too are ordered according to meaningful principles, that everything we do is significant to a greater purpose, and that it will all work out in the end. But stories are ordered from the beginning in a way that we can only do by virtue of hindsight, by looking back afterwards and trying to make sense of everything that came prior. Therefore, when we recount our own lives as stories, as we so often tend to do. We are basically fictionalizing what really was. Take historical biographies for example. Here it becomes especially clear that people's lives are never retold as they truly were. In fact, events are often misrepresented, shuffled around or made up altogether to ensure that every part of the story becomes directly meaningful, purposeful, to the greater end. It is why, as many others have pointed out, that musical biographies all tend to feel the same. Even though the real life stories are all unique and are oftentimes barely comparable to each other. We love you! It is also the reason that we can now look at certain historical figures and say that they were indeed born to do what they do. That they were made for greatness, or that they were doomed for tragedy. All this is not to diminish or undermine any real life accomplishments, but the point is that when we retell these stories, we fundamentally separate them from reality. And because of this, we tend to mistakenly create the illusion that whatever goal was achieved, whatever outcome got materialized, was already, in a way, destined from the start. And that everything along the way was directly meaningful to this end. And this, of course, is not how we experience our own lives. We live looking forward without knowing what end, if any, 
is built into our actions. We can act with a certain goal in mind, but we never have the security that the actions we take towards that goal will actually bring us closer to it. Even if there is a predetermined meaning to what we do, we don't have access to it until we are once again looking backwards. Still, it seems that, more than ever, we are obsessed with heroic adventures. Not just as stories and films, but also as expectations in our own lives. We are increasingly occupied with turning our lives into adventures. We want our lives to be exciting and memorable. At the very least, we want them to be meaningful. We want them to have some sense of coherence. And we tend to retell our stories as such. As if we are the heroes of our own cosmic adventures in which every experience is framed as significant. As a stepping stone to some greater purpose. Why is storytelling so closely related to our own personal identities? How exactly does the hero's journey impact who we are? And how we see ourselves? And how does it affect our society as a whole? There are many important questions left to explore. And we will get to that next time. In my upcoming video, I'm going to further explore the monomyth that lies at the basis of most of our storytelling, and how it relates to our own lives. In that video, I'll be specifically examining the history of the heroic adventure, and how, over time, it became not just the basis of our stories, but also of our personal identities. In the meantime, if you want to learn more about the hero's journey, I highly recommend you check out Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces on Audible, the world's largest audiobook service. Here you can also find other great books of his like Myths to Live By and Goddesses to further your understanding of the stories that connect us. With the Audible app, you can listen to audiobooks anytime, anywhere and on any device. And if you go to audible.com slash like stories of old or text like stories of old to 500 500, you can do so as well with a 30 day audible trial that lets you listen to one audiobook and two audible originals for free. So if you want to dive deeper into the work of Joseph Campbell or simply explore Audible's vast collection of audiobooks, be sure to check out audible.com slash like stories of old or text like stories of old to 500 500 and start listening today.